Hey, I'm Adam Cook. Welcome to the Bite Britain podcast, a show dedicated to interviewing the most successful restaurant owners in the UK, learning about what goes into their incredible menus, but more importantly, what it takes to run the successful restaurant in this day and age. An Edinburgh institution, Henderson's has been on the map since 1962, originally started by husband and wife Mac and Janet Henderson as a way to distribute produce from their East Lothian farm. Today, the tradition and philosophy of Henderson's continues, now topping a total of four Edinburgh locations, serving locally produced, organic, vegetarian and now vegan food, with a number of awards under his belt including the recent Best Vegetarian Business of 2019 from the Food Awards Scotland, it's safe to say there is no sign of this institution slowing down. Today, I welcome Janet Hume to the podcast. Welcome. Thank you, Adam. Perhaps you can just start by just telling us just a little bit more about you and then just give us a little bit more um, of an insight into the Henderson's brand. Absolutely. So thanks very much for inviting me along to have a Discussion with you. Um, so I am Janet Hume. I'm third generation um, in the Henderson's family. The business um, was started by my granny, Granny and her, Janet Henderson. That's who I'm named after. Um, and then when she um, sadly died, it was passed down to her seven children. And then the seven children, they, the eldest got the farm and others wanted to do various things. So they've kind of taken their, their kind of, I guess, their bit of the, the funds out of the restaurant that they, they wanted. And now it's down to the last two children who are the owners of which my mother is one of them. And then it's her brother. So it's Catherine and Oliver Henderson who own the business. And it's myself working in the business now and it's my cousin Barry who's also working in the business and he's the general manager so um it's been um it's definitely been a journey and it's now I guess we're at the third third generation so it's now introducing uh, the third generation to the business but also the business being ready for the third generation coming in sure wow and so just just a quick question then there is it's I usually would ask people what inspired them to open a restaurant, but obviously you've had this passed down to you, but I guess yeah. you, you wasn't, you didn't have to agree to take this role on. Right. So kind of what, why, what made you decide that you wanted to kind of continue this tradition? Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I've, I've grown up obviously with the business. Um, so my mum used to joke that actually the only reason I had friends um, was that when we went to Edinburgh, we got a free lunch. So they knew they could get a free lunch too. <laughs> um, so, you know, I've, I've, I've very much grown up with this business. I would say um, a lot of the diet I've grown up on has been vegetarian based. Um, and really, it's not about, it's not about, um, the idea behind Henderson's is that it's, it's an open door for everyone. So everyone should have the opportunity to eat affordable, healthy, wholesome food. It doesn't matter if you're a vegan, you're a vegetarian, whatever your preference, you're pescatarian, but there should be something there for everyone, particularly now when we've got more prominent, um, I guess, challenges when it comes to diet. So you now got gluten-free and, and, and you know, people with peanut allergens again. So it's making sure that there's something there available for everyone and it's delicious and it's wholesome. And you don't notice that the traditional, which was obviously your meat and two veg, you don't notice that actually you're missing something because the meat, you know, the meal is itself. So I have been in London for the last seven years and um, I only moved back in the last six months. I've been, okay. I, I, I've been involved um, over the last few years, invo involved in meetings and board meetings, and um, then I made the decision to come back. Um, my degree or my background is marketing, and then over the last seven years, I've actually been working in, in um, food companies, but on the other side, so I've been the one with products right. selling. So I worked for a company called Loving Earth, and we sold vegan chocolate and vegan whole food products. So I'd be the one going to the restaurants and saying, hey, look, I've got this, this, you know, this amazing chocolate, la la la. So um, I guess my journey has kind of been, in the end, ultimately, I knew I almost wanted to come back at some stage. I don't know if I knew it was going to be this soon, actually, that I was, I was going to come back, but I'm back. And now I'm in the business and um, I, I'm involved with sort of the marketing and the sales. And um, again, we're kind of just working out where everything fits in and, and where, where people can be involved and where they can add value and 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 that's the stage i'm at so so yeah i, I feel very very um passionate about the business and i feel very lucky and very fortunate to have you know a business that i can come into but i also feel very lucky that i've also 
not been in the business forever and that I have had um, seven years in London and I was working before that as well. That, so I've got a different, um, you know, I've got, I've got different ideas, particularly in London. Um, there's a lot of amazing restaurants out there and the innovation and everything that's happening, the Ottolenghi and Ethos and Mildred's, all these amazing places. So again, it's nice to have, have experience and know all the London market. And again, to be pulling some of the ideas because yeah. Henderson's maybe is, is something a bit unique and, and special in Edinburgh, but we, we still need to push that ball forward and we need to move, move the industry and innovate and create. And yeah. so yeah, a lot of opportunities. I feel very, very lucky to be involved. Sure. And, and, and what was the inspiration behind your grandparents starting Henderson's? Because it was a huge yeah. step. Right? I mean, I'm thinking, I mean, I wasn't obviously Nothing. around that long ago, but I mean, I imagine opening a vegetarian restaurant in that yeah. day and age must have been quite something, right? Definitely. So she absolutely never said anywhere on any piece of the building or outside that it was vegetarian because she didn't even want to scare people off. You know, she didn't want people to say, oh God, no, because you're right. I mean, she was a complete pioneer. She was, um, I mean, a serious innovator. And, and not only was there the challenges in terms of um, sort of getting people to think about different ways of eating, um, there was also the challenge that she was a woman. It was the 60s. If she wasn't married, she oh, wouldn't yeah. be able to have a bank account. Um, back then, there really wasn't um, places where women could go alone and feel comfortable. Um, so, that, so that was, you know, she really wanted to create an environment which was open to everyone. It didn't matter what race, what religion, what sex, whatever your preference, you know, she wanted to make it comfortable and she she was actually if we want to go even sort of back into the the sort of the you know where it really all began is she was actually told when she was a teenager that she wasn't ever going to have children and she went to Vienna to stay with one of her relations it was sort of an aunt or, or a great aunt maybe and this woman was a vegetarian and so then on my my grandmother Jana was very interested in health and diet and sort of herbal and, and natural healings and then so she was quite a sort of spiritual person mm -hmm. and she then obviously then had seven children <laughs> so she then realized how important uh, that's why our motto is um eat better live better because you really are what you eat so she then um, married her, her husband, James, my grandfather, and they had a farm together and they started selling their vegetables in market gardens, I'm sorry, you know, farmers markets in Edinburgh. Yes. And then they opened the shop, uh, which we still have on Hanover Street, the original shop um, in 1962. And that's where she was selling the vegetables from the farm, which were all organic from their market garden. And then she realized that actually she could sell, instead of opposed to selling the cabbage, she could chop it up with some other vegetables, add some mayonnaise, and she could sell coleslaw for three times the price. So she bought below the shop in 19, 1962, she bought the downstairs, and that's where we have the main restaurant, which we call the salad table. Right. Um, and that's really kind of where it all began, and that was really the inspiration behind it. And she wasn't actually a vegetarian. She was, it was just more about balanced diets and health and whole foods um and so yeah and, and i mean she would just be utterly delighted to see the the change in the industry now with how veganism's booming and vegetarian and now every well, single yeah i mean she was she's ahead of the game clearly i mean <laughs> completely completely and now you, there's not a business you now go into a, a restaurant where there isn't an option i would say now for well yeah vegetarian. i mean good luck being a restaurant trying not to serve yeah for vegetarians vegans all that stuff these days yeah absolutely wow um so tell us a little bit more about the the food so i mean where's where does the the inspiration for the menus come from so i mean do you, do you still do you still grow a lot of the food yourselves do you, is it i mean i know it's locally produced i mean sort of how how does how much is i guess sort of where does the inspiration for the menus come from? But I guess as well, I'd be interested to know sort of how much it's changed over the years as well. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have the market garden anymore, sadly. So my uncle still has the farm, but he's not hes not interested in, in farming so much. He's, he's taken different avenues to, and he's got his own business and X, Y, and Z. So the market garden is something we absolutely long-term want to go back to. I mean, we're spending an absolute fortune on all these vegetables and actually we should just be having our own market garden and doing a lot more seasonal. And then, you know, I mean, it is difficult we are in Scotland and obviously the the climate doesn't allow for loads yeah, of sure. uh, variety and also a lot of the ground ground because we're right by the sea a lot of it's very sandy so again that adds challenges but we could do things like more pickling and more um you know just kind of go back more to basics and go back more to to the Scottish roots and and as I said 
you know, when it's not in season, we can have pickled X, Y, and Z. So there's, there's things we can do, and, but we are also a business and we also have to be providing a, um, a variety of dishes. So, so 100% we want to go back to the market garden. Um, so now, now we try and get a lot of our, our vegetables, they're, they're local. We definitely need to build, you know, stronger relationships with, with, the, with the, um, the local surrounding farmers because now, you know, packaging is a real challenge. But mm. we do have buying power, so we kind of have to turn around and say, look, no, we're not going to take it if you're packaging it in little X, Y, and Z. So okay, yeah. if we went back to the market garden, we wouldn't have that challenge. So, yeah, that's something we want to go to. But um, the, I guess the inspiration for the food, well, I mean, a lot of it, I think, is still it's very similar to kind of what we served back actually in the 60s, but we've just kind of tweaked it or with more seasonal vegetables, it's been, you know, different seeds or different, you know, there's just more access to variety now. Obviously yeah. avocados back then you just wouldn't have, have had. So there are, there are, it's a lot of, I mean, I, I don't, I think she actually, you know, she really kind of set the standard. She set the, the sort of bar of what she was serving. Um, and I think yeah, it's just been tweaked over the years. We have we have a we have a cookbook, so again we will go back to that. We'll I saw that, yeah. There. And then you know we might we might innovate the dish a bit. And um, obviously now I think there's a lot more international people working in the business, whereas back then in, in the sixties there was a lot more local people. So they bring their ideas and we go from there. Um, our haggis is sort of sort of renowned. We've won awards for our haggis, and it's um, a vegetarian obviously haggis or a vegan haggis even with, with lentils and kidney beans and carrots and oats, and it's absolutely amazing and loads of spices. So I mean that. That, that is that dish has been around for a long time um, and then actually even one of my granny's puddings which is called sour cream and ginger and it, I mean it's quite simple it's dried fruit with ginger and sour cream that that has been literally on the menu since 1963 when the shop the restaurant oh yes yeah, so there are still a few a few items yeah. that are still, uh, yeah. still hanging around right <laughs> That's and people come back proud. you know <laughs> year after year after year and if it's not there and they're saying we know what so so yeah it's awesome. Amazing. So um, you came onto our radar due to your incredible online reputation, effectively. But I guess, you know, locally, you've got a huge reputation as well. So I want to try and learn a little bit more about that. Part, part of this podcast is really to, for food fans, but it's really for people that are trying to understand, you know, how to have or get into a food business themselves. I want to try and understand a little bit about, obviously, you know, this reputation has gone back for generations. but how how do you build and maintain your reputation your reputation in such a, a fast paced and really quite aggressive industry? I'd, I'd really be interested to try and understand that because that's got to be a challenge, especially with your marketing background. Because you've probably got some good ideas around that, right? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's definitely we do, we had the USP back then because there was no other competitors. You know, there was no there was absolutely no one else. I mean, we really there's cranks in London who have been around since the early '60s as well, but and they're now no longer and there's a few other businesses um in london food for thought i think that opened up in the 70s and um, you know there 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 really weren't back then i mean we, we potentially could be the longest standing vegetarian restaurant in the uk i mean i i don't know of any others that are been around that long but that's not that's not a fact um mm. so i know um you know people took Janet's idea and I mean I met for example the sadly it's closed down it was in Covent Garden food for thought but it was it was um started by a couple a few people and one of them was this chap called Simon Hope and I was given his cookbook one year by um by a friend and actually ended up meeting this chap Simon Hope and I was like oh I'm loving your cookbook it's great la 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 you know how did you know where did you get the idea for your restaurant and your cookbook and he said well actually I went to Edinburgh and I went to this restaurant um, called Henderson right. and I went, oh, that's funny. So, you know, he, she, she's inspired people over the years and in Edinburgh as well. Now there's so many, I think it's the third best city in the UK for vegan food. And that will be her, her influence, you know, being around. So I think we, we are just very lucky in that we do have a strong brand and people know us and, you know, you meet so many people and they say, oh, I went there with my mom. I went there with my granny, la, 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 la. But I guess... In terms of like newer businesses entering the market, I mean, I think from, I think customer service and the service we're providing is absolutely crucial. I don't think we hit, you know, we don't always nail it, but, but I think for new businesses is people, you know, looking for community. They want that familiarity. You know, they like going in and being greeted. They like going in and knowing they can have a coffee and sit in the same spot. So, and I think again, we're moving away from these chains where we, we had sort of all the independents and then we've had this wave of chains and now the chains are kind of, I think, tailing off and people are wanting to go back to the independents. So yeah. I think really having your, your sort of your 
independent business is a strength. It's not easy. There's a lot of costs attached to it with the councils, with the rates, with the rent. But if you're doing the sort of the seasonal food, the local food, the independence, um, you know, the fresh food and really giving that awesome customer service, it's not easy and it's not easy finding the niche in the market because everyone's doing everything. Mm. But I think, I think, yeah, it's, it's offering, I guess, sort of simple, delicious, um food with that amazing customer service and something that's affordable um you know people do want to go out and spend and they do want to go out and have a nice time so again it's about the experience of the person when they're going out so actually they can have a kind of mediocre meal but if they've got awesome customer experience and in a nice environment you know you can you can totally carry the food yeah no absolutely it makes a huge difference yeah yeah but yeah, it's it's not easy. It's not easy, but so I, I really do. I take my hat off to these people that, that that give it a go and go for it, and, and that those that can crack it. And I think in particular Edinburgh, I see there's a lot of amazing, amazing coffee shops and little bakeries. And I'm so I'm so pleased to see that again. If they do last, I mean, a lot of them. I think there's a very high rate of a high percentage of businesses that start, and within six to eight, six to eighteen months, they fail. Yeah. Um, so that's always very sad and you do see the turnover in Edinburgh but there's also a huge amount of independent businesses doing well and, and they get the local support so I don't know whether it's partly Edinburgh and the community um, but I think people want that they want to go back to basics is what I feel yeah. no, a huge, huge trend that we you know I'm definitely seeing with a lot of the restaurant owners that I've been, been speaking to um, certainly over the last few months is you know the people are going back to the independence you know there's if I if I go back to um you know where I used to live in, in South East London um the high street that my mum and dad lived near um, when I used to probably if you if I went back probably five to six years ago mm. there was there was Costa Coffee there was Starbucks there was yeah. Cafe Nero there was all of those and they were doing great mm. Starbucks have closed down recently yeah. now they've really got the independent coffee shops that have taken over and they're thriving and I think it's, it's really, really great to see. But I guess it must be quite hard. I guess as, as a, you know, and it, you're independent business. Obviously, you've, you've developed, you've got chains now, you've got, got four total restaurants. So it's, uh, is it challenging to try and keep that kind of that, that independent heritage while still growing as well? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, um, yeah, for sure, for sure, for sure. I mean, we are very much a family business and an independent business. So we need to be, as a business, talking more about our USP. You know, we've got an amazing story. We don't talk about it enough. Mm. Um, we definitely need to be talking about it more. You know, I went to a sort of family business conference last week and they were, you know, you really got to shout about your story these days to stand out and why to come to your restaurant because everything is made fresh. Everything is, you know, you know, delicious and wholesome and it is affordable. Um, so yeah, it's, um, yeah. I think I'm veering off the question now. Go back, no, remind me. No, I was just trying to understand like, as, as a, it's absolutely fine. Now as, as a, as an yeah. independent restaurant, you know, you've, got, values, you're growing, yeah. you've got chains and stuff and yeah. it, it's kind of, I guess, I guess it can be risky that as you grow and as you yeah. get more and more locations, yeah. you kind of lose that local yeah. feel. Well, I think the thing is, we're, it's, I think we're not technically, I'd say, because it's four, we have got four um, sort of restaurants. I'd say, though, they're all, they're, it's not chainy because they actually all have their own independent vibe. So one's a vegan restaurant, mm. one we call the salad table, which is where there's loads of salads and very quick sort of counter service. One's a shop and deli and one's a sort of cafe vibe. So yep. they've kind of, we've kind of kept them all quite individual, but they all sit under the umbrella of Henderson's. So I think in a way that's made it easier because the customer's coming to the different or units are actually coming there for different reasons. So they're not just coming to all the same kind of Henderson's if you go to a Pratt, you know exactly what you're getting. They're all, they're all slightly different. So I was working today, for example, in the shop, which is like a deli shop. So we've got the retail side and then we've got the sort of the restaurant side or the cafe mm -hmm. side of it. And um, you know, people will come in and they'll, they'll grab a takeaway and then they'll buy some oat milk, whatever it is they're buying. Um, and they can sit in, but really if they want a restaurant, we then send them downstairs. So three of our sort of outlets are actually all together in the same, they're separate um, 
sort of restaurants, but they're in the same building. So right, we okay. send people down to the restaurant. So it's kind of, we haven't kind of grown in the sense that we haven't, we haven't got one formula. It's kind of all under an umbrella. That makes sense. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of, so, you know, you can go to one, one, like one part of the brand and it's take experience, a totally different experience. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So we've kept but it all kind of links yeah. into the same yeah. concept, the same yeah. ideal, you know? Exactly. So that's, I guess that's how we've kind of not, um, yeah, we, we still get different customers to different units because they are unique and they're, so that's why I guess, you know, we've kind of managed to keep uh, the sort of the foundation or the value kind of. Um, yeah. No, I think it's, it's so important these days to, to that, that, that local feel is just, it seems, it seems to be some, whether it's going to be still on trend in five years time, you know, or six years, time, <laughs> who knows, but, but people are going back to, you know, their yeah. roots effectively with this stuff exactly. and it's not just it's not just food it's just like life in general i think people are starting yeah. to see that like you know things like modern ag agriculture maybe it's not the best way to to you know consume food maybe we need to go back to local yeah. produce and you know all of these things and and you know people you're seeing a lot more people being spiritual now as well meditation all, all these yeah. things which we've done for many many years as humans yeah. we've kind of lost in the last couple of generations and now yeah. seem to be turning turning around and, and coming back and people starting to see actually these are the important things that have caused a lot of the, I guess problems environmentally and mentally yeah. as well for, for some people and I, I think it's really really good to see like one of the examples I, I, we um, did an interview uh, earlier today with another restaurant owner and was talking about um, the uh, recent news about Jamie Oliver's brand like yeah. falling down yeah. and how, how you know and I don't know if you've seen there was a really really touching video that's on on youtube if anyone wanted to look it up um where he actually goes back with davina mccall i think it is to his original 15 restaurant that's been shut down and it just looks like just there's like bits of food everywhere it's just been left it's just mm -hmm. almost like a little bit in time where someone just snapped their fingers and he's obviously really emotional about it but yeah. it you know it, it goes to show you know even even if you're that if even if you're you know that well known that much of a celebrity actually if you don't pay attention to the trends of the market yeah. and it, it's a very dangerous game and i think that was one of the potential problems one of the things he admitted to is that you know he, he was trying to focus too much on having a massive restaurant this huge empire of restaurants that are really very big and lots of seats and he was saying you know exactly what what we've just been talking about people are now going back to that yeah all our kind of local feel restaurant and i think i think it's a really really important thing and i think it's a uh, it's so important really i guess the, the main point is that you know, you've got to pay attention to what the trends yeah. are, right? Yeah, 100%. You've got to um, listen to your customers. You've got to look at the trends for sure. Yeah. And they, things change so much um, and so quickly now, especially with things like, you know, social media, all yeah. that stuff. You know, what, what's hot yesterday isn't hot tomorrow. And it's like, there is, yeah. there's just, there's just so, so much to really take into account. I think it's so important, you know, if, you, if you're in the restaurant industry, you know, you really have got to pay attention to, you know, what's changing, what's coming through while still trying to, at the same time, stay true to your roots and it's yeah. a lot to juggle right <laughs> yeah it is and with social media i mean it's great in a way because you are getting feedback negative or positive things you can work on but then it's also it's quite dangerous because if you don't if you do let things you know if you don't nip things in the bud then and there you don't want that problem walking out the door because if that problem walks out the door it's going to hit you somewhere whether it's google reviews or facebook so you know you've really got to capture make that customer feel really if you've had a rubbish experience, you know, somehow turn it around before they yeah, leave the right. business. So they leave thinking, actually, that was awesome. But actually, it made an absolute shit show. But, you know, you've, you've caught it. So that's, you know, really checking in with the customers as well. You know, was everything okay for you? Make them feel that like they are totally loved by yeah. you is so important as well. And, 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 you know, you have to go above and beyond to, to make it. Obviously, ultimately, if they don't walk through the door, the business isn't going to last. So yeah, absolutely. And I think the consumers have so much more power and, and I think it's a good thing to be honest, but the consumers have so much more power now, you know, it doesn't take much to, you know, you, you for someone to set up an Instagram account, get posted on Instagram and within a few years they could have a million followers and be an influencer. Right. And they've got yeah. you know, no, no financial backing, no company behind them. They're just a normal regular person, but they've yeah. turned, themselves into a brand and i think i think it's it's great i think it's great great but it does mean that if you've got a business and you're not paying attention to your customers then you're going to be in a lot more trouble now than you might have been 
you know, 20, even 10 years ago, maybe. 100%, absolutely, yeah. And then that's why, sort of going back to talking about, you know, what's important as well, is your staff are so important in the sense that they, I mean, really for a business, the, the first um, person or the, the first line of importance in your business is actually, it's not your customers, it's your staff. Because at the end of the day, they're the ones serving your customers. They're the ones talking about the story. They're the ones out there, you know, promoting you and, or talking positively as a positive yeah. employee or negative. So, you know, again, have your, the staff are so key. Um, and then if they're happy, the customers are happy. And that's where you get the, you know, the close the loop in the sense that the repeat yeah, business and customers. It comes up. I don't think there's an interview that we've done yet that uh, somewhere an owner of a restaurant um, has not mentioned how important yeah. staff is and staff are. I mean, it's just, it is, it's, it's such an important factor, right? Because they're the people representing your brand. But 100%. I guess one of the other things with, with that as well is um, actually giving responsibility to the staff. And I think a lot of people struggle with that, especially, yeah. you know, when they're, when they're starting out, maybe they've got sort of, they've just launched a restaurant and then they need to relinquish some of that responsibility to other people. Yeah. I think that's something that people struggle with. I mean, 100%. How, how do how do you find that? I mean, did, did, I guess there, I guess there must be quite a lot of staff in Henderson's brand. Do, do you do you find that um, a, a challenge? Hundred percent, for sure, for sure. I think um, it's definitely something we struggle with is handing over responsibilities and handing over things. And you know, we, we go to these um, family conference events, family business. Well, we went to this one last month, last week, and it was funny that you know when when people sometimes come in, these consultants, and they say, well, you know, if something breaks, who's the one? To pick up the break and you know it's often one of the family members it's often the owner because they care and it's not that people don't care but the, the sort of the family and the owners are too quick to do it that actually you've got to kind of trust your team to do it you've got to trust so that trust is definitely it's it's a challenge and i think it's a challenge no matter if you know it is a family business or isn't a family business I think in all businesses it's it's a challenge but yeah even more so in a family business um, and i think also the thing is if you don't hand over these responsibilities and these projects and these and these things people don't feel included and people don't yeah. feel sort of valued so again it's so important to make people you know you want to change the coffee so okay has anyone got any coffee knowledge that they want to bring to the table to discuss or help with this project because if then they feel a part of it and included there's there's more reason that they're going to upsell the coffee because actually they chose it or they you know they know more about yeah, it so again it's it's we struggle with it for sure 100 percent. but i mean I'm, i think we're very aware how important it is to sort of to try and build that trust, to try and hand things over and, you know, monitoring it, but not micromanaging it, you know, letting it kind yeah. of breathe. And it's, it's a really, really tough, you know, line. It's a really tough thing and it's a really fine line to get it right. And I absolutely, I don't think, you know, we've nailed it for sure, especially now coming down to the third generation where we're much younger, you know, my cousin's mid are both sort of young to mid thirties. So again, it's, you know, then we're working with people who are a little older than us and oh, then they think, you know, so it's, it's tough, yeah. it's tough, but it is key. And, you know, if, if people are starting out a business or looking to doing something, you know, there's so much, there is a lot of, like, I think particularly in Scotland, there is a lot of um, support out there, you know, they want businesses to succeed. So there's a lot of sort of enterprises and funding and okay. there's a lot of things you can do. And, and I think it's always, you know, you've got to, you've got to put yourself out there and, and try and grow and learn and take mm. courses the next Y and Z. And if you have the opportunity to, you know, it's, it's definitely worthwhile. Yeah, no, I think, I think it is a real challenge because the other, the other thing as well is it's very easy to sort of think that your ideas are the best, right? If you know, you're, you're, you're in your case, perhaps, you know, it's your family. Um, you know, it's easy to think, well, I know what's best. I, yeah. My idea is better than everyone else's. And <laughs> sometimes they're not. A hundred percent. Absolutely. Completely. Yeah, no. And, you know, that's, that's certainly something that I've struggled with personally in my own business is actually giving people, you know, the, the ownership of some of their own ideas yeah. sometimes. And, and yeah. sometimes that can pay off in, in huge ways that you never yeah. expect. Um, and I think that's really important for anyone looking in, looking to get into you know, food business themselves or any business really is just to, to be prepared to, to give up some of your, yeah. you know, some of your ideas and, and be prepared to let other people step in and yeah. you know, try things themselves and, and, and relinquish some of that responsibility to others. And I think it, it comes up time and time again, but it's just so, so important. I think that's probably one of the biggest failure points of, of you know, restaurants or even businesses when, when they're starting up is you start hiring staff and if you start micromanaging them, yeah. some of the, you end up losing some of the best staff. You end up losing because they, they don't feel like they've got the yeah. creative control that they want in that role. Yeah. And yeah. You know, if they're good at what they do, they probably deserve it, right? Yeah. And it, before you know it, you've got someone who's 
kind of happy to be micromanaged because they're not too bothered about you know putting themselves out there and stuff and actually maybe that isn't the rest of the business you know totally uh, totally you want you want kind of leaders who you can trust and they can go off and and do x y and z and you, you know you trust them um so yeah it's, it's it's tricky one i think i think it's probably a common challenge in a lot yeah, of businesses it's certainly been a personal one for me as well 100 percent and so i want to go back a little bit more to the food side of things so what is your most popular menu item at the moment well, and why Probably, well, probably the haggis. I mean, it does, um, it is one of our sort of best sellers and it is in all our departments. So I guess that says it in itself that, for example, we have a, a haggis wrap in one of the departments and then the other, um, you know, the departments will do it with the traditional um, clap shot, which is turnips and potatoes, and then maybe serve it with some nice local kale and then with a red wine gravy. So it is, I mean, it's, it's heavy. It's a heavy dish, but it's super filling. It's very healthy. It's very wholesome. Um, so that, that, and I guess, I guess it's, you know, it, it is, it does, if a, it does make sense well depending on the business but you know having a signature dish is always very good so mm. that people know they come to you for oh i go there because of the the lanyard or i go here because of x y z a signature dish does help a business for sure and probably haggis is one of our signature dishes and obviously being a traditional scottish restaurant and a scottish family scottish business it kind of all fits in together but yeah i mean our, our haggis is it's delicious so if you come up to edinburgh <laughs> find me in henderson's and the haggis is on me <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why i always do these podcasts without eating this is always <laughs> what i did now i'm starving hungry yeah <laughs> but um so so does the, the haggis does that um do you do you just do you sell that to eat straight away do you sell it so people can take it home and cook it themselves as well i mean no it's mainly i mainly i mean i guess people could do a takeaway but it's warm we serve it we serve it from our it's our hot dish and we'll serve it from right. well i mean not all not all the departments have a hot dish but it's it's cooked for in the restaurant but we did we did i mean we have dabbled in things over the years it's definitely been a journey i mean we've had we've had a bakery before we'd had a bakery that we sold off and then we had a bakery unit where we were doing actually a lot of things like pasties and takeaway food and before MS really kicked off we were kind of doing the sort of the takeaway food and yeah, yeah. Um, and then i think you know MS really kicked you know put up the grew there the, those side of things so we then yeah, kind yeah. of downsized and sort of went different routes so we, we have tried a lot of things okay. um over the years but no at the moment it would definitely the people are coming to eat in or as i said one of our units is a takeaway so people can take away wraps and haggis will be in that wrap so yeah awesome so in terms of um obviously you know henderson's hugely successful restaurant um i want to try and understand about sort of decisions that perhaps you or the team have made personally that's really contributed to to its success, you know, I guess I guess recently. But also, if there's perhaps anything that stands out that maybe previous generations have done that have led to success as well. I don't know. Is there anything that comes to mind? Oh, nothing kind of jumps out. I mean, it's been such a journey, and there's been kind of so many people involved over the years, and it's you know it's changed hands in the family, and different people have done this or that, and. Um, I guess nothing kind of like jumps out. I mean, everyone is absolutely 100% committed in making, making the business success. And I wouldn't say it's about making money. It's about obviously the business has to make money to generate, to keep yeah. going and people need their, you know, my, 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 my mom and my uncle, you know, they're kind of retired. So obviously they need a need an income. And um, so, um, it, it definitely is a tough one, but it's really, it's about delivering, you know, at the end of the day, the, the, the business is about delivering this good food, this wholesome food, this affordable food and, and giving a good mm -hmm. service. And um, I guess one of the things we've introduced, well, one of the things that has definitely become sort of more prevalent and particularly with us over the last few years is obviously this, this sort of tackle the plastic challenge, the single use plastic. So, you know, all our packaging right, yeah. compostable and we can current, we don't sell any plastic bottles, you know, everyone, everything we sell can or glass, which can be recycled. And we ask people to bring their water, you know, we're a refill station. So we ask people to bring their water bottles. You know, we, we work with um, a, sorry, a recycle company um, and they do all our recycling. Our general waste is very minimal. You know, we cycle all our cardboard, our cans, our plastic, our glass. Um, and 
Um, we partner with Too Good To Go. You probably know them. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've recently, I've only recently been introduced to them. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's a good idea, isn't it? It was a young guy from Denmark. He was young 20s who started it. I mean, it's probably about, I don't know how old it is, maybe five, six years ago. But yeah. one really launched in London about, yeah, probably about three years ago. And then when I moved up to Edinburgh, it really wasn't in Edinburgh at all. So we started, we were kind of one of the first on their books for Too Good To Go in Edinburgh. So we've been doing Too Good To Go for a few years now. And that's great because, you know, at the end of the day, if there's something we can't sell we know it's not going to waste obviously the staff are happy to take yeah. stuff as well but um you know we work with Tuga to go that's great and we work with a couple other sort of um charities where we can sort of donate the food but you know really for us having no waste i mean that's that's ultimately i guess maybe again a long-term goal is kind of there's a really cool place in london and brighton actually you should chat to those guys silo and it's a zero silo. waste restaurant there's absolutely no waste wow um, at all so that would be awesome for us to actually I mean we're, we're, we are doing so much but it would be great to be able to sort of put that title above and say look we're zero waste I mean you know there's always especially for us because we have a very fluid menu for example in our salad table which we write up every day in a chalkboard and um, it sounds very old-fashioned when you say that but you know it's a white pen board and um, awesome. you know that's the great thing is we don't we don't have which because actually if you've got some old carrots they go in a soup if you've got some old peppers you know you pop them in a salad with some oil and so, so that's, that's, that's sort of the beauty of our business is it's quite fluid and flexible. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess we're really, we're, guess we're really trying to move now on that sort of environmental conscious train. And I mean, we have been obviously since day dot, but again, trying to, trying to, trying to grow that and, you know, carbon neutral and all this, and, and the more we can do and the more people we can partner with, um, you know, it's, it's great. So yeah. And what's, what sort of, what sort of challenges do you kind of see like in this day and age, I guess maybe perhaps you're, you know, grandparents may not have seen. I mean, you sort of touching on, I guess, some of the some of the issues with plastics and things like that. I guess that wasn't an issue back then. Oh, no, what other no. kind of challenges do you feel that in this day and age you face that, you know, maybe yeah. you know, when it initially started out, there just wasn't around. I mean, is there anything that kind of comes to mind there? Well, I mean, I think footfall generally is, I mean, as I said, back then in the 60s, 70s, there really wasn't many places to go. So everyone came to Henderson's. I mean, I met a, a friend's uncle the other day and actually he told me quite a funny story. He said, this chap said he gave to his brother when he was 18, a book about where to find all the ladies in Scotland, like which, <laughs> which locations to go to, to pick the ladies up basically. And then it was in the seventies, it was Henderson. So, you know, it, it really, it really wasn't, it was the place to go. And I'm not saying it wasn't because it wasn't good, but there really was such a low, op, op, the options then were so small. And also my granny had an alcohol license. So the place that now we call the vegan used to be more of a bistro, well, more of a bar, really. And as long as people came in, so she had a late night license, late night alcohol license. And as long as people came in and had a slab of cheese and three homemade oat cakes, they could have five glasses of wine. So, I see, you know, right, yeah. <laughs> so, so it really was, <laughs> it was the place to go. Um, so now I think footfall is lower generally in the center of Edinburgh because now people are working from home you know they're not having to travel into the offices or they're um you know you know all these remote workers mm. and then I think also in the center now there's M&S you know it's there's Dishoom around the corner which are still I mean Dishoom is a small chain but again it's a family-run business or family-owned business and so there's a lot more competition there's a lot less footfall so it's definitely tough um, I just think we are very fortunate position why I said we need to talk more about our story and our, our brand because we are fortunate that we do have this really strong brand and you know there's a rarity when someone doesn't come to Edinburgh and they don't know or they live in Edinburgh they don't know Henderson's and you know again with the tourists now we get a lot of tourists but again what we really need is we need to be maintaining our loyal regular customers and yeah, it, it's tough it's tough it's definitely it's definitely slowed down and again, that's where you've got to manage your, you know, reduce your production, reduce your wages, but try and, you know, so th that's kind of, I think, I guess where I'm going to be falling into everything in terms of pushing forward the marketing. But um, so, yeah, it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah, I suppose that's the other thing as well, because where, where we've kind of lost footfall, we've kind of created this now, what I would guess I would call like a digital footfall, where you've kind yeah. of got like the people passing through Instagram, passing through Facebook. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, I've kind of got to treat that, and this is you know being in marketing myself. I kind of you have to kind of treat that as your shop front as well as yeah. your actual shop front, right? Because yeah. people are passing through that just like they would a high street, and yeah. you know, neglecting that now 
would yeah. be a complete disaster, right? But the question yeah. is like, how do you how do you put that same message across that you've got? You know, when people walk into the shop and experience all the great things they experience, yeah, that across on social media, as if someone so if someone gets the same experience as like walking past what yeah. would have been walking past the restaurant. You know, it's a it's a really interesting thing, and I think that's that's another thing that has changed has changed so fast. Like, in yeah, totally. The internet's not been around long, but I mean, social media only it's only the last. 10 years, maybe five years that it's really yeah. taken off to the point where it's almost now, if you are not using like social media or any kind of digital marketing as a restaurant, yeah, I, I don't think you can survive. I really don't. Yeah. Think, I, I think. I agree. And then, and I, I was, I have been, um, you know, I've, I've at networking events though. I do often kind of hear people saying, I mean, you might not agree with this, but they often say, you know, a lot of this, particularly in the, in the restaurant industry, in the hospitality industry is you know a lot of the marketing is coming from your people your staff but you still have to be engaged with like you say the social media side of things but they very much they often say just you know go for one focus on whether one whether it's you know instagram or facebook or this but then again i know now i feel that things because now there's so much choice out there in terms of social media channels that you know the older gen are doing facebook but the younger gen are doing instagram and then there's snapchat and then you know how do you how do you how do you really get that message across to everyone, you know? Yeah. But then yeah, I, think, I think the key is, you know, you, there's, I think with what you're saying there, it's like, it, it'd be great to be on every single platform and be kind of nailing every single platform. But at the end of the day, if you've not got much time in your yeah. day to do it, you're better off actually just doing a great job of one rather than yeah. a mediocre job of everything, you know? Yeah, um, definitely. But, you know, yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we've seen Instagram really grow, but Instagram started to change change a lot recently as well. People are, don't seem to be getting as much reach as they used to. Now, now we've got things like TikTok coming on that. I installed that on my phone. I don't even know that one. <laughs> I've got no idea how to use that one. <laughs> so I'm, I've, been, I've been trying to learn that over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, so that's a, that's a new one. Yeah. Again, it's just generational as well, isn't it? That's the thing. Like, yeah. you know, Facebook, Facebook was cool until your parents went on it, right? And then if I moved over to Instagram, now... <laughs> My mum and dad have got, well, my dad, I think, has got an account on Instagram. I still haven't learned but, <laughs> but, you know, just, just keep keeping, trying to, it's almost a full-time job in itself, I guess, just trying yeah. to understand, you know, all that stuff as well, right? Totally, absolutely, 100%. And then you don't use it for a while, and then you're getting no likes because you haven't used it. So, you know, they really, they're keeping you hungry, aren't they? They want you to be engaged so that, you know, oh, it's just, yeah, minefield, but hey-ho. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, um Another thing that I really want to get into um, with with sort of business owners is habits, things that help you on a either a daily, weekly basis to maintain and grow your business. And there's certainly a lot of bad habits you can have out there. Um, but are there any habits that you would recommend to anyone trying to get into the food industry that maybe you have or maybe your staff have, whether, whether it's you know personal or whether it's you know business related specifically? Any yeah. habits that, that you kind of would, would recommend that people people consider? Well, I think I think if it is a business starting out, I think always when it comes to sort of hiring and inductions, it's crucial for that person if they can to have engagement with the with the owner or the family member who's involved, um, because I think you've got to kind of set the values quite early on. Mm. Um, so I think um, I think if you know you can sort of I guess from the beginning kind of nurture or, or sort of set the foundations that's very important and then also I think having um, I think when it comes to the customer sort of service side of things sort of having a little a little list so that when that person is engaging with the customers they've almost got like a little a little tick list so they know okay they have to check in at the end, you know, was everything okay for you or how was your day or some, right. something just to sort of a little, because I think the thing is, is you can often sort of run before you're walking and, and we've definitely, we were for sure, we're, we've our periods where, you know, you're suddenly growing and then you haven't done this and you've got to have that in place and blah, blah, blah. I think it is important to have a strong foundation so you have clear procedures and clear expectations of the staff and clear things because communication is an absolute nightmare you know communi making people feel going back to what you're saying about making people feel involved you know what i mean communication is just it's again it's a challenge in every business no matter what the business is and what industry but it's so important to try and keep those communication channels open mm. and when there is a problem to try and nip it in the bud immediately and not let things sort of get out of hand 
Um, I mean, that's all kind of quite vague and broad and nothing specific. No, no, no. It makes a lot of sense, though, because, you know, it comes back to, you know, the subject of staff, right? And making sure yeah. that they understand not just communication with the staff, but also then that communication has got to go from the staff to the customers. And it's, yeah. I think the bigger you get, the more layers there are. Yes. You know, being yeah. able to, to make sure that message doesn't get diluted from the top yes. way through yeah. down to the bottom. It's just got to be a... Yeah. I mean, is there anything specifically, like any kind of like takeaway tips that you've got for anyone that's kind of, you know, perhaps trying to improve their communication in their business? I mean, you said sort of there was like a little tick list, like a prompt card. So kind of any, and I mean, how, how do you sort of work? Do you have sort of like um, weekly team meetings, anything like that? I mean, how? Yeah, yeah, there is, there is, there is, yeah, managers meetings and then there'll be team meetings. And again, it's always hard to pull it all together because you've got all these sort of separate units. And again, it's how you're getting everyone to work together. And, yeah, you know, but the person ideally, well, again, it doesn't always happen with us, but the person that's coming to work for Henderson's is employed by the company. So they could be in one department one day and actually in theory the next week they could be somewhere else. So again, that movement's quite good um, because then people yeah. are engaging with different people and seeing different things. So again, if, if you do, if you are doing different teams or different departments or different units, whatever the restaurant's doing, if you can get a bit of a flow of staff, I think it does help because people do see different things in different departments. And then again, it kind of pulls it all back together because if it's too segregated, people are not, they're just going to be doing their own thing. They're not going to be seeing that yeah. actually, oh, hang on, we're doing it here, there, but actually this is better or la la la. So yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't think of anything specific. I mean, I'm not in the sort of, I mean, I'm, I'm still sort of learning myself, the industry. So I don't have any like hot tips at this moment. Maybe next year I will, when I'm a little no, bit that's insightful. In, integrated. In, in, <laughs> no, 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 that's, that's, that's insightful. I mean, I think that's one of the big things that um, causes businesses to suffer is the miscommunication. Yeah, totally. To customers, but to staff as well. 100%. Um, People get upset, they leave, you know, staff turnover, which again, is a challenge in the industry, you know, chefs and good 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 staff is hard to find absolutely and making sure that when you do find good staff that you actually keep them as well yeah <laughs> they, they stay right that's that's, yeah. that's a challenge in itself um so we're coming towards the end of the um the podcast now but i want to try and understand just for anyone out there that's looking to to get into the food business what advice would you give to anyone who's kind of thinking about starting something up? Is there anything? And, and don't please don't say don't don't do it. <laughs> we had a couple of people try and say that, and I won't let it. Well, <laughs> I, I give I give my hat off to anyone who's giving it a go these days. You're brave and good for you. I mean, you know, it's a huge. There's just there's so much competition out there. I mean, it's just it, you know, I, as I said, I feel very lucky to be part of something or entering into something that's you know it is an established brand because creating brands and identity and getting that loyal customer. I mean, it's so tough so you know absolutely amazing for anyone that's doing it but there is still so much opportunities you know there really there really is um but i think you know you've got to kind of be got to be genuine and honest and you know don't try and project a brand or an image or something that you don't believe in you know if you don't believe in what you're doing you're not going to succeed you have to believe in what you're doing and you know i mean i felt very lucky in my my company where for previously loving earth i mean who are an australian uh, brand and they're just they're just an amazing company in terms of sustainability and ethics and all that and they felt so privileged again to work for them because they were just so genuine and they cared about your people. You know, you have to care about your product. You have to care about your people. You have to care about your staff. You have to care about your, 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 you know, the customers coming in. If you don't care, then don't bother. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, that's great love, you, you can't love, get into it just for the money, right? No, exactly. If it's about financial gain, don't bother. Do something else. You'll make quicker money somewhere else. Yeah. Because with hospitality and restaurants, it's a lifestyle business. You've got to love it. You've got to love people. You've got to love it. So, you know, don't, don't do it. If you want some quick cash, do something else. But Don't trade not, stocks. Even though that's pretty good enough for you. Very yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> there's so many there's so many good ideas out there and if you're passionate and you believe in it then yeah just just go for it and you've got to be bold you've got to be brave you've got to hustle <laughs> for sure yeah, you've got to absolutely. hustle you've got to network you've got to you've got to push the boundaries you've got to push yourself outside that comfort zone and you've got to expose yourself and yeah you've got to you've got to go for it but you know i think i i highly respect um people who want to go for it and yeah just just 
give it a go. You're gonna not that you've got nothing to lose, but you know, if you don't do, try it, you never know, do you? You never know, and there's nothing worse than that, especially with exactly. kind of got an entrepreneurial mindset for sure. Yeah. Um, so finally, um, want to know kind of what's next for Henderson's? You know, what have you got in the pipeline? What things can we look out for? You know, any anything people should know about? Anything you want to want to tell people about? Well, I mean, I guess sort of going back to the beginning where we want to go back to our market garden, you know, we really want to be, um, again, closing that loop. So from the from the gate um, or from the garden gate to the plate and, you know, really, yeah. really, because we do do a lot of it, but we don't do the whole thing. So um, I think I, I, we, I mean, I think the business is I personally, but I'm one member of the family, don't see it being a big chain. I don't see it being global. I don't, you know, I don't see it being um, massive. And it's the next Whole Foods, for example. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, no, and not that, not that I don't think, um, I, I'm definitely more interested in about the health, the diet, the educational sure. piece. Right. Letting people come in and teaching them about food, going into schools and talking about X, Y, and Z, and 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 you know zero waste and having maybe like zero waste stores. We could do something like that, you know. And um, I kind of, I'm kind of definitely more around that route and definitely community. So again, you know, maybe maybe at some stage we'll be in Glasgow. I don't know, but at the moment for me, it's definitely about Edinburgh, creating that community creating that hub, you know, this really um, lovely environment to go to, all this great food and, 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 and learning and having the opportunity to, um, you know, yeah, just, just, just have a, a very welcoming atmosphere and environment and, um, you know, keeping the business going. It's, yeah, keeping that spirit alive, right? Yeah, keeping the spirit absolutely. of the restaurant alive. Yeah, keeping, you know, totally. Staying true to the roots. Absolutely. And the culture and, you know, keeping it, the, the family and, that's and yeah growing growing people with us and making people you know our staff heard and they, they can grow into this and that and being a great employer you know being a great employer in edinburgh is very important to me as well so there's 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 a lot to do there always is and you know it's one step forward two steps back um but um yeah and it's not it's not going to be an easy journey it's never easy working with your family <laughs> no i can imagine yeah <laughs> don't recommend it oh. No, <laughs> I mean I love them dearly, but it, it adds an element of challenge because bet, yeah. you employ someone if it doesn't work out, and you know you can part ways politely, but I can't part ways with my family. So um, no, it's not so easy that one, is it? No, it's not. <laughs> so, um, but but you know it's um, yeah, it's it's great. It's great. I love it, and I feel as I said, very privileged, very lucky. I feel very honoured to be part of it. Um, but yeah, I guess there's also the pressure, you know, what's next for Henderson is, I mean, there's also the pressure that we're now the third generation is actually maintaining it. Yeah. So, you no, know, it could all go Pete Tong, you know. You, just, <laughs> you don't want to be the generation that drops yeah. from that, right? <laughs> exactly, absolutely. So, you know, it's my cousin and I now in the business as well. So the previous generation were at least brother and sister, whereas we're slightly removed. So, yeah, we don't want to be the generation that drops the ball. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so, oh, so you think you're doing a pretty good job so far, yeah. so I think you're right there. <laughs> so if you haven't been to Henderson's come in and find me and speak to me say hi um you know you know the door's open for everyone awesome and if people want to find you online website social media channels where yeah. can they find you yeah Henderson's of Edinburgh and we've got Henderson's vegan um Instagram for the got two accounts and then our website yeah Henderson's of Edinburgh I think we come up we're, we're sort of high up I think when people are searching vegetarian restaurant luckily we're sitting very high in Edinburgh um, and then, yeah, we've got four Facebook accounts actually for each of our different sort of units. Um, and then I'm, I'm kind of around, I'm Janet. I'm always, you can always ask for me. I'm always in one of the departments or hiding in a corner somewhere doing some, some boring admin, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm very much an active person. I'm on the counter as well in, in different roles. And I like, you know, I love working with the people. I love meeting the customers. And, you know, it's so nice when people come in and tell us stories, which of course there are so many, there are so many stories over the years. And it's great when people yeah. come in and say X and Y, and I came here and I did that, or I used to work here, and la la la. We love it. So if people want to come in and share their stories with us, we'd love to hear them. And it'd be even nice, we thought at some stage, when you're talking about what's next, is we, we'd like to sort of, I guess, revamp a little bit our cookbook. And it'd be good if we could add some sort of stories in there as well. You know, people's stories over the years. That would be quite fun. So Yeah, what's the cookbook called? Is that, is that available online? People, uh, it should be when you're talking about online and capturing that. We definitely need to do more with the online. It's, it's in store at the moment. Um, and okay. yeah, Henderson's, there's a salad book. There's our, their Henderson's of Edinburgh cookbook. I don't know the exact title. I should have one. I do have one here. And then there's a salad, a Henderson salad book. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, you can email email the business. Um, all the details are online, and we can always post them out. But but yeah, that that we'd like to sort of judge at some point, some stage, because obviously there's all these, you know, Leon and Ottolenghi and yeah, yeah. all these amazing books out there. You know, we need to we need to do something to evolve that. But um, but yeah, all in good time. For sure, awesome. Well, thanks so much for your time. Really enjoyed that interview. Um, that's it. We're done. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for listening, and we'll see you on the other side. Thanks for listening to Bite Britain. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bite Britain and also subscribe to us and watch the video version of this interview on YouTube so you can get updates on future releases and more importantly, exclusive opportunities to win prizes from our awesome guests.